Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering natural health on your Wednesday morning rise and shine. Natural health we're doing here this morning as we look at the topic, Fall's idea of what constitutes a good life. Fall's idea of what constitutes a good life. Uh, this is something that can plague any of us. I want to look at this idea here this morning. So welcome again to our live talk program. Hopefully you had a blessed night rest and you um, are ready to take on today or we'll get some tools here to take on today. Um, God bless you. Let us pray. Thank you again, dear Lord, for your love towards us. And we thank you, dear Father, for your blessings that you give to um, us in our lives. We pray, dear Lord, for you, the unction of your Holy Spirit, that you may guide my thoughts and guide those who are listening, that they may receive uh, something for their life and for the betterment, dear, dear Father, of themselves and ultimately their salvation. May you bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Uh, so we're looking here this morning at this topic, um, Fall's idea of what constitutes a good life or a high life. And this is something that, as I say, uh, can plague us. If you have a false premise, if you have a false starting point, and you have a false direction of life, and you're going to go chasing whatever put you on that path, um, you will end up in bad places. That's just the reality of life. And so when you start out um, with a false premise, when you start out in the wrong direction, ultimately what happens is that you're going to end up in the wrong place. And what I'm talking about here is just in general the idea of what constitutes a high life or a good life. And if you have a wrong um, idea, then you're going to be chasing after whatever, like they were saying life, which is what I want to talk about here this morning, chasing after um, a high. You know, the person is chasing a high because they're chasing a false idea of what constitutes a high. And so I start out um, by reading a text of encouragement here, Psalms 37 verse 7 through 9. Psalms 37 verse 7 through 9 says, How excellent is thy love and kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasure. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. Continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. So this is where you, you can see here the psalmist has a different take on what constitutes a good life. And if you have a right starting point, you say, this is the path I'm going to go down, and I'm going to go after this idea here of what good life is, you will end up in the right places. Um, but if you start out, and you start out with the premise that it's that alcoholic beverage or that drug that will secure for you the good life, and it's an integral part of the good life, one will end up in the wrong place. And that's just the reality because, especially when we're younger, when we set our minds on what constitutes the good life, and we are set in a path, we will forever chase down that path. But the Bible guarantees us that it is in a certain lifestyle and in certain practices that is prescribed within the Bible, that when we explore those and we go deep into those, they take us deeper and deeper, but it never takes us into destruction. They add to our life. They benefit us. They increase our well-being. But if you go down the path where the world will take you, the problem is you go deeper and deeper and your life become worse and worse. And that's the real problem there because you can have a person that um, they're now even 70 and they're still chasing after the high. Whatever the high is, it could be material possession, it could be the love of money. It could be alcohol, drugs, all kind of physical gratification. And the more you chase that, it's the more life gets worse. You see a person chasing down food. The more they chase that, they don't get better. They get worse and it cuts their life short. And that's what we see happening in the society. The society 
not only is 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 having problems health or, or financial problem but we see other problems with drugs because a person is chasing after a certain good life and it will lead you down a certain path because if you believe this is the source of my happiness this is what constitute the good life then you're going to get deeper and deeper because you keep as i say chasing that high so i'm going to get to two articles and i want to get back to some of these scriptures that to me delineate um clearly shows what these what what the life the good life is and if you go after it you'll find that the more you get into the life the good life that the bible prescribe um is the more your life becomes better and you suffer no ill you know other than people hating on you and persecuting you um other than that because you live amongst human beings and we are still here on this earth your life the deeper you go with christ is the better your life gets is the more the crud and the garbage get removed out of your life so that's what we want so in his light we will find life we want life and we want a life more abundantly we will follow god's way life is better uh, i won't read this article but i'll just point to you that and probably by now most of you had heard the, the thing and basically it's a quick headline i read oatmeal breakfast foods contain unsafe amount of cancer um, link weed killer so things like roundup and so forth are in um, oatmeal link food so oatmeal which is normally uh, most of the time I think oatmeal I recently bought oatmeal organic but most of the time oatmeal is just regular you go buy Quaker Oats and it's just Quaker Oats and I think that's interesting because normally Oat probably get a pass because most people are focused on wheat and corn and soy, uh, the big ones, and probably less focus on like oatmeal or oat. And so most of the time, I think if you buy like Quaker Oats or any of the other brand of oats, if there's any other brand, I don't even know, you would end up with just a regular oatmeal. And the oatmeal is um, linked to glyphosate. Uh, glyphos glyphosate um, glyphosate is norm is the main ingredient or the active ingredient or the only ingredient for um, Roundup, which is the brand that is built by Monsanto. And what it does is that the the, the crop is engineered to um, to not be killed by the gly glyphosate, and as the crop is protected because of the engineered. Um, genetical um, modification done to the crop the glyph the glyphosate kills all the weed around uh, but doesn't kill the product that is engineered so then my question is then is um oat genetically engineered because um why would it have high concentration <coughs> sorry why would it have high concentration of uh glyphosate um in it is it the next door neighbor farm that is getting it from? Uh, because normally Roundup is used as a weed killer because it kill killer thing broadleaf uh, weeds like dandelion and so forth. So it could just be that they just use the glyphosate um, glyphosate on on the oat, but ultimately, I guess my question would be: Is the oat itself genetically engineered to not be affected by the Roundup? So anyhow, the Environmental Working Group came out, and as you probably saw, uh, just about every single, uh, I guess it would be uh, regular cereal with oat, has trace amount of uh, glyphosate that is linked most naturally to uh, cancer. So beware of that. And when we say linked to cancer, what we're talking about is this stuff here unravels your genetical your dna structure it destroys you internally it, it it messes you up it confuses your system because what you do you place it something that was never part of the original creation is one of the messed up stuff that they do in the lab so keep that in mind i'm not going to get into that i just wanted to drop that there just in case you're listening to me here this morning or you're going to hear the podcast podcast later and you are not familiar so just whatever you do um i would say going forward uh, don't give any of those things a pass simply if it's not organic or GMO, GMO certified non-GMO certified oat just don't buy it 
use um, use natural as far as possible because uh, that's that's news to me. Uh, but sometimes, as I say, most of the time I'm thinking the big hits, you know, corn, soy, and wheat uh, that has these um, that is exposed to all this uh, Roundup and stuff. But uh, here they have it going in something else. So I'm going to get back to what I mainly want to talk about this morning here, which is, again, my topic is fine idea, false idea of what constitutes a good life. So two quick articles here. Um, about, this is like um, last week. Yeah, so this is last week. Um, uh, this article is from last week. It's like it's entitled New Haven Emergency Team Respond to Nearly 80 Overdose Cases in park um and this is written by doug stalin and it's a park near yale so just in case one is thinking where well it's in a good area um the number of people treated for apparent overdose of a synthetic drug at a park near yale university over the past three days increased to nearly 80 on thursday Three people were treated since midnight, according to the New Haven Emergency Operation Director Rick Fontana, while um, a WVIT TV crew saw emergency teams treating two people on the New Haven Green on Thursday morning, including one person taken away on a stretcher. No fatalities have been reported since the first three cases surfaced Tuesday. Um, the incidents have prompted the Connecticut City to issue um, a public health alert. Officials said three people have been arrested in connection with the overdoses, including a man who may have been given out free samples of K2, a synthetic form of cannabis. K2 caused multiple overdoses in New Haven in February when five people overdosed on the drug within two hours resulting in one death we heard from people on the green this morning that it's uh it potentially include pcp emergency um, service medical director sandy uh boguchi abokuki uh i think um told reporters wednesday some of the reaction of of the patients in the emergency department would suggest that there was an opiate involved as well. Um, and uh, it says emergency crews began responding uh, about 8 a.m. Wednesday to multiple calls reporting patients vomiting, passing out. New Haven Fire Chief John Alston uh, said, after the six, um, sixth response, we knew that now we are going to have a um, multi-casualty incidents he added even while we were trying to return people to service they were passing victims um on the ground alston said signs of overdose include cases where the person will not wake up has blue lips and fingernails clammy and cold skin shallow and slow breathing seizures or convulsions or no respond to knuckles being rubbed hard um, on their breastbone. A similar incident occurred in July when more than a dozen people in the same park were treated for sicknesses related to synthetic marijuana Associated Press reported. It's a nationwide problem. Let's address it that way, Alston said. Every agency, police, fire, medical, hospital, all are strained at this time this is a problem that is not going away all right so that's the first article go straight into the second article here um just an article now on synthetic pot synthetic pot is a public health danger experts say this is now from nbc news um, associate press release a decade after first appearing in the united states synthetic marijuana is growing is a growing health um, danger expert says so it's been a decade they're saying that synthetic pot has been on the market I, I always thought it was here longer so I'm gonna have to double check that but that's what they're saying I thought I used to see that stuff selling years back in the uh, the 7-eleven type stores some marijuana smokers turn to it because it it is relatively cheap and not detected in routine drug testing uh, dozens of people in New Haven, Connecticut, were taken to hospital last week 
after overdosing on a batch of synthetic pot. While states have moved to legalize traditional marijuana, synthetic marijuana is unregulated. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, research showed that synthetic pot affects the brain much more powerfully than marijuana, creating unpredictable and in some cases life-threatening effects, including nausea, including nausea, anxiety, paranoia, brain swelling, seizure, hallucination, aggression, heart palpitation, chest pain. Let's pause here a little bit. Uh, so if you notice here, uh, this is a product that gives a more powerful experience on the brain, affects the brain more powerfully than marijuana, and it's cheaper. So it's cheaper with a more powerful effect and it's not detectable in the urine. So there goes some problems there. As I say, if if your aim in life is to chase down a false idea of a good life and you list those examples, more powerful effect on the brain, not detectable, cheaper, uh, you're going to have problems. Enough that somebody could just go in the park and give it all like candy. Um, it is linked to violent behavior and suicidal thoughts and can also cause kidney damage severe enough to put users on dialysis. Synthetic pot is made by taking plant material and spray it with chemicals that can mimic the high from marijuana. It, it is sold under the name on the names like K2, AK-47, Spice, Kush, Chronic, Scooby Snack. It is a Schedule 1 drug, joining cocaine and heroin as a drug with high abuse potential. The chemical also can be, um, can, the chemical also can also be mixed into a liquid and vaped and mixed into tea or into food. The substance can produce some effects similar to the tra to traditional marijuana included relaxation, elevated mood, and altered perception. I'll pause there again. So if you notice here, uh, if I'm going through other problems in life and I don't want to deal with the problems of life or face the realities of life, I need altered perception. I need to perceive things a different way. I need a total different way of um, taking in life. And if you think about this, you've, I'm sure you've dealt with individuals who when you talk to them and you're, you, you had an experience similar to them. You were at a place, something happened, and you could take a lesson, somebody, you could learn a lesson from it. And you're talking to the person and they come away with a different take of what happened total different take probably you've opposite total opposite 180 degree opposite from what you experience and then you say well they have to have an altered perception perception but you either assume or know the person is not high they're just making up stuff because they don't want to take in the lesson so that's purpose but imagine now if the person like i need to have an altered perception because the lifestyle i'm doing I have to be able to put a branch, the Old Testament call it putting a branch to the nose. You need to kill that stench. So drugs does this. And if you have a drug that is cheaper than marijuana, but it can relax you, it can elevate your mood, and it can alter your perception, there are situations in life that we go through as human beings that can drive a person towards that. Or... A person chasing on a certain lifestyle and not accomplishing it, the marijuana or K2 or heroin or cocaine or whatever can alter your perception. So you perceive um, the, the, the activity or the action or the lifestyle you live in to be something that it's not. So a person could be living on a, a, tr a bus, on a bus, living on the, a bridge or living on the, a tree and in their mind, they're like, they feel failed at life and it's depressing. They get some cheap K2 and all of a sudden, life is good. And that's where drugs is a 
constant problem because in this life where we live, where we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we run into so many problems, you know, somebody being abused physically, sexually, mentally, somebody um, failing in life, somebody making wrong decisions and end up being a problem, somebody going down a certain career path, like being a prostitute or being a drug dealer and seeing that all the customers are dying or just having messed up life and they feel depressed. And the drugs now make you be able to survive that life. But the Bible teaches that there's another way. And this is where the problem is. The Bible said there's a way to the good life through confession and repentance and going on a certain path. We're going to talk about that in a second. But I just want to show you why the drugs not going away. Because as I say, as long as this life can be so depressing and boring and abusive, it, you know, the drugs has a call. And this is why no matter how much people die today, of drugs, the people around them will go take the drugs because somebody died doesn't mean your life is any change. Probably makes your life even worse. And so if my life is worse and I can't change my reality, well, probably what I have to do is go to the drugs. See, and that's, that's where the Bible comes in and say, child, I offer you a different solution to your problem. Anyway, we keep reading. Our authorities... I've detected scores of chemical in synthetic marijuana. Scores of chemical. That's fascinating. And say, um, chemical composition can vary not only from product to product, but also from batch to batch. Some ingredients are banned by the federal and uh, by federal and state law. Drug dealers peddle synthetic marijuana, and police say people have been able to buy it online or in convenience stores. Or gas station. As an unregulated product, synthetic marijuana is not tested for safety. Earlier this year, more than a, more than 160 people in Illinois um, were sickened and at least four died after using synthetic marijuana tainted with rat, rat poison. Health officials track reports of illness related to synthetic marijuana through hospital emergency department visit or poison center cause poison center report thousands of cases each year including 8000 in 2015 this year of at last month poison control center handled about 1300 calls for synthetic marijuana illness illnesses so this is what's happening here um there so just imagine somebody uh, basically put rat poison in a product and give it to you. As you know what rat poison does, rat poison is a blood thinner. So what the rat poison is going to do there is going to thin the blood. As it thins the blood, the person bleeds out. Uh, that's what it would do to the rat. Um, and so you imagine now the blood is thin, thin, the heart is racing because it can cause heart palp palpitation. So you have an elevated blood pressure and the person's blood is getting thinner and the heart is pumping harder. Problems. So this is the type of stuff. So it they have tested, detected scores of chemicals. So it's just whatever. You can imagine you're making a thing and you're like, man, I need some more. Or you just go inside your kitchen and get some bleach and throw it in there and then go and sell it to people. And they're selling it as if you're at a trade show. Begin at a trade show, they give you free samples. And you go buy the free, you get the free samples, test it, and then you say, okay, I'll go buy the product. Um, they're just giving that stuff out as candy. In a park in Illinois, in a park in New Haven, near Yale. So this is how ubiquitous or how common what we're seeing around us. It's not like you, you're a safe zone anymore. Wherever you can go right now, you can see the effects of the drug problem um, in homelessness, in um, all kind of crime, in bombed out, broken down towns, um, in people walking the streets looking as if they're in a, in a, in a movie, 
similar to what I saw in the preview for Schindler, Schindler's List, like they're in concentration camps, but they're free. Uh, or they in a movie, some horror movie, because they look kind of gaunt and scary. This is what we're seeing in our society. And it's not just something that is in, as before used to be in certain neighborhoods, certain cities. Now it's it's everywhere. In as I said, this is happening in a park near Yale. And it's happening everywhere across the country. And I believe part of this, part of the problem, is the methodology of trying to get the good life. Because uh, as long as we have life as human beings, we want to go after better. We want happiness. We want to have peace in our soul. And um, because of this desire, I believe we're going after it. But if we have a false premise of our false idea of what constitutes the good life or how to attain it, how to get it, or how to deal with my problems or the problems I see in life, then um, I'm going to end up in the wrong place. If I have a false idea of how to enjoy life or what life is going to give to me, you know, say I have an idea that, you know, it's always going to be good. Everything is going to be good because this life is good. There's no evil. Um, then I'm going to go down a certain road, not thinking that evil is lurking by. I think because of the drugs, uh, that idea is being shattered where you can't escape it no matter where you go. Because we're in a rural area right now, or you're in a urban area, the effects of drugs is everywhere. You could be in a paradise somewhere near a beach, or you in a paradise somewhere in the middle of an, in an oasis in the desert, probably somewhere in Arizona, and that thing's gonna pop up because what it is is that is that I see like a whole generation of people who've been taught to go after that good life. But a major facet of going after the good life is being high. Because while you're going after the good life, there's mess around. And life is hard to, basically, it's difficult to cut through a pad and separate out the mess all around. Because wherever it is, human beings, they bring the mess. You know, I've been fascinated before I go to some of my texts here that um, they will put a picture of the, like the, because of all the modern social media. Someone will take a few people take pictures and share it of an exotic site somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Pacific or somewhere in South America or Africa or somewhere. Uh, a few visitors go or a decent amount of visitors go. People have heard about it and they go and visit. It could be a beach. It could be a rock formation. It could be a unique landscape, a unique waterfall. And, you know, people go take pictures, share it on, um, you know, on various Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And then they share it. And then within a year or two, <laughs> the, the, the site becomes overrun with visitors. Everybody wants to go there. Uh, because everybody saw it, and everybody like, I'm going to book my vacation. <laughs> or as a matter of fact, I'm booking it right now. And they go book it because everybody's chasing after that same thing. And if somebody take a picture, and they look happy in the picture, and it looks unique, and it's a fresh experience that the person is having a lifetime experience that they've never had, and you know, yada, yada, yada. Somebody saw it and like, I want that too. And what's driving that is not so much that they must go there, is that they must capture that experience, you know, and, and the person tried it, but then a whole bunch of people want to capture that experience because if I get that experience, you know, my life is going to be improved. And that's what a tourist attraction is for. And then you have the place overrun, then there's garbage everywhere, there's desecration of the site, the site is just being treated in that irreverent way. Um, and then they started to say, well, we probably have to close this site or limit the amount of people or we start to have to do tickets or, you know, whatever, because it just gets overrun because everybody's really chasing that high. And this is why with the more unsatisfied and, you know, misery and boredom is the more people are like, 
whatever it's gonna give me you know like people always make this joke that if you see a person acting a certain way a somber person would say man whatever that person is on i don't know what it is but whatever it is on i need some of that and they say well i'm gonna get it so this is where now i come to my bible passage here for this morning uh, where i started Whatever that person is on, I need to be on it. And I need to get that. But if whatever that person is on, it seems good, normally especially when a person is younger and just started out using certain substances or living a certain lifestyle practices, it, the effects of it is not seen because the effects of it accumulates just like the good life as prescribed by the Bible. The effects of the good life by the Bible is accumulation the more you're sanctified is the better your life becomes and that effect becomes stronger as you get older more mature in the lord and as you take on those practices but it's the same thing with a moral practice the more a person live a certain lifestyle and go to after say what we're talking about here is drugs their life doesn't improve their life become worse their social life unravels their moral life unravels, their physical health unravels. So we want to go down the life that is not going to unravel our life, but it's going to benefit us long term. Uh, before I get to anything, I want to read this text in Galatians. Galatians 5, verse 19 through 26. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelry, or reveling. Of such as, as, and such like of which I tell you before. So he's saying, I've told you before, I've told you in time past that those who do this will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, the problem with going after a certain thing, like it says drunkenness, right, which is our main focus. Uh, the more a person go after drunkenness, being high, it's more it mess up their life. Because as it says, certain drugs have a high rate of addictiveness. And the more the person is addicted, everything in their life becomes secondary. And the things in life that are secondary is the things in their life that will bring happiness to them. The happiness that they are chasing after. And the longer they use the drugs and the alcohol is the more, no matter who we are, we get addicted and we get deeper into it. But the more it messes up physically, mentally, socially, so forth. But so is true for any other things like this. A person who likes war. After a while, we just become a warmonger and it just mess you up. A person who is a hater, after a while, become filled with hate. And after a while, it turns into, it, it turns in internally. And they internally live a life where they just hate and even hate themselves a bit the hater. Because they will feel the pain of hate. Because the more a person is a hater, is the more the person is going to get back some of that hate because what goes around comes around. A hater is not loved by no one because all they do give hate and so they receive hate. See, so long term, this doesn't work. But if a person have this false idea that say reveling, just get up every day and party, party, party. And I like how the Bible lines up drunkenness and reveling next. Is it, it doesn't get better as they get older. It just get um, corny. You know, you see a per. You've seen this. You've seen. I've seen pictures where you see a picture and there's a bunch of young people partying. You say, okay, young and foolish, they're gonna learn the hard way. But you see somebody say, well, that person like their fifties with a whole bunch of kids around them. It's like, wow, they're partying with their grandkids. And you'll be like, oh, by now you're supposed to get off the dance floor. <laughs> Some people keep on the dance dance floor as they get older. So none of these things work long term. But short term, they can dis be deceptive to think that it's cool. You know, imagine all these young people now 
doing mixed martial arts, MMA. It might seem short-term to have somebody punching your head and kicking you as something, oh yeah, I'm the man. By the way, I throw two tattoos on me here. And I get some tattoos and I get kicked in the head and punched in the face all the time. And they think, great. But how long does that last? That's a youthful loss. And that's not something that constitutes the good life. That's the bad life. How long is that going to go on for to be kicked in your <laughs> Be kicked in your head. I laugh because, you know, you can see somebody by the time they're late 20s, early 30s, their brain is like fried from one too much punch in the head and being kicked in the head. Somebody knocking you by kicking your head. And you do that as a regular thing. As that's what you do on a regular basis for entertainment. They, they, you know, this is emulation. And that doesn't work. And whether it be those guys who do that or the young guys who do American football. It doesn't work. Being kicked, kicked in your head and smashing your head and somebody running into you. And you feel like a, an accident. You're going through on a regular day basis multiple accidents to make money. And you see, you think about it long term, that does not constitute life. But in a young person doing, say, mixed martial arts, oh, they're tough. People are like, look, he's tough. And you say, why? Oh, you get kicked in the head. <laughs> you get kicked in the head all the time. But 10 years, so the person is 30 still doing that, 40. Can you see a person 50 years old doing mixed martial arts, 60? Do you a 60 year old, <laughs> do you see a 60 year old man doing that, 70? can't do that long term but i'm gonna tell you if you live the good life as prescribed by god anything that god asks you to do you can do it long term you can be like noah you can preach the gospel for 120 years longer than most people will ever live almost everybody will ever live and it work you see righteousness is life sin is death the wages of sin is death but with wages you have to work to earn a living you get paid after you work not before not while but sin does that but the, the flip side now is that righteousness is long term so if you have a right idea what constitutes a good life as i said in the beginning it seemed like we're equal in other words you know if i decide to accept the lord and i'm um i'm young i got rebaptized at 21 and so that's the age where you can start drinking. So if you compare me, and it's not even ignore genetics, because some people are born with a better set of genetics than myself. I've accepted that in life. <laughs> but if you compare genetics now, you you if you've been living, say, for 10 years or more, living the right the life that the Bible constitutes or prescribes, eating a diet, a Genesis 1.29 diet, exercise and taking care of yourself and you compare your body your social lifestyle that means your relationships your friends your marriage all that stuff and you compare your um your moral lifestyle to somebody your same age as i said ignore genetics ignore the fact that the person is born with a good set of gene genes or not just apples to orange it doesn't matter that's how powerful this is it overrides even genetics. And you compare yourself. And you're going to simplify it in all matrix. Physical health. Mental health. Social health. Um, financial health. You know, we can keep going. You're doing better. If you live by the word. So that's why it's important, especially for younger people or for where you are right now. To get on a good path and to consider and ask yourself a question what constitutes the good life? And if you have the right answer and you start chasing after that, you'll find that you will not be chasing the wind. You will not be reaping whirlwind in your life, not a bunch of mess. And as the years go by and you invest more who you're really benefiting. You're bringing joy to the Lord, but you're really benefiting yourself. You're pleasing God, but you're really benefiting yourself. Because whatever we do that is not in accordance and in harmony with God and His laws, 
what we're doing, we're hurting ourselves. Now, many times people believe that if they follow the things of the Lord, they're doing God a favor. You're not doing God a favor. You bring joy to the Lord's heart. The Lord, I have pleasure in you. But who you're blessing is yourself. A person who decided they're not going to do emulation. They're not going to get up every day and have people thumping them in the head. They might, oh, I'm missing out on something. I can't be in the gym and connect with the boys. So they can connect with me with their fists in my head. It's true. You're going to miss that. But I'm going to tell you, 10, 20 years later, you're going to be like, praise the Lord for the last 10 years or 20 years. I've not suffered any trauma to my brain. Praise the Lord that it was for all these years I didn't take any K2 or any, what do they call AK-47 or Kush or Scooby Snack. Praise the Lord I didn't take any heroin and stuff because it's good to have a clean brain. It's good that whatever the thought process, you can process it. You can make that transaction in your head. Because that's an investment, you know, in you. And that's important for you to understand and live by that. But if you have a wrong idea where so many young people coming up, they think in order for them to be happy, they have to be high or drunk. And they're chasing after that happiness. And it's a false promise of happiness. They're going to get worse as life goes on. And you see people living on park bench. You can't get them off that park bench because in their mind, what constitutes happiness is the high. And so they have to sacrifice anything to get that high. But if you have a different idea of what constitutes happiness, then you chase after that. If you see family, relationships, friends as word, you chase it. See, I, I give me a person that doesn't see the value of having friends. And having a stable home life and having good relationships outside of their family. That person will never invest a dime or a time in those relationships. And so they never get the benefit of it. You get that one? Did you get that? If a person don't see the value of it, they won't invest in it. But if you are told that this is valuable and the Lord says, son, invest. And you start investing. As you invest, you start getting returns. You start saying, wow, just like a person hunting on money, a person that loves money, they invest in it. And as they invest, they get more money, so they get more interested in the investment. And they start putting more time and effort because they like the returns. It's the same if I say to a person, it's valuable to have good, strong relationships. The person like, I don't want to hear that. They never see, they never get the idea. But if they, they say, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to try. And they invest and they get a look of benefit. They'll be like, wow, this really works. And they go invest more. And it's the same thing. So now they start to have a place in their life where they receive happiness and receive satisfaction. And it has nothing to do with drugs and alcohol. And so they're quite happy. And I'm quite happy with the relationships that I'm investing in. And... Somebody might see me who is high or drunk and it's like, man, you ain't living a life. This is the life over here. You know what I'm saying? And they, they're like, they'll belittle you because in their mind, or they belittle me because in their mind, they'll be like, man, you ain't living no life. I'm living a life because I'm drunk. Because that's what they invest in. But every year, they get worse. And they become less satisfied in life, unravel. Every year, you go the Lord's way. Your life gets better. How somebody will see and say, why are you happy? You know, I'm happy because, you know, I have some things that are reaping benefits for me. Somebody over there said, why are you sad? It's sad because I've been kicked in the head. <laughs> too much time. And my brain is fried. You know, and that's life. So that's why the Bible said, choose life. Uh, so real quickly here, verse 22 of the same Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. Somebody say, if you invest in self-control, there's benefits to begin. Yeah, there's benefits to begin. Come on over here with me and start investing. It's a blessing. 
Um, the Bible tells us, though, that part of the problem here is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. The Christ says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's so real. I know, because if I say this to a secular person, the person will be like, uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. And the reason why, because you can't serve two masters. If you serve the devil, you just have to serve the devil and live the devil's life. The people on the street living that life, they're just living the devil's life. Devil's life. They're carnal, they're running after the flesh. They either have to just come 100% on this side and say, you know what, I'm going to go, go the Lord's way or they can go the devil's way. Can't do both. Can't be religious and trying to chase down that life. I show you a person who's trying to be religious. Ah, they're dabbling religion. I can show you so many people that go to church sometimes once a month twice a month even weekly but they're dabbling with re religion so they're never re not really hunting the good life in christ that's just the reality they're not going after it they're just going after a kind of a good life while they're trying to get the world's way get the lord's way and get the world's it don't work if you have a false idea of what constitutes the good life then you will end up in the wrong place the true way is the Lord's way. Um, and so here, a quick statement. So a lawyer came to Christ and he asked Christ, you know, what is the greatest of the commandments? So Christ answered this um, in verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Pause there. If you love God with everything that you have, that's a good place to be. You know, think about relationships. It, relationship is what all of this is about. How you relate to nature, to God, so forth. And, you know, you, how, how that works. And so if you love God with all your heart, that's a good thing to love. Lord, as he's revealed in the Bible. Now, just this idea of a, of a being that has power, that um, engineers all of this. But God, in his totality, has revealed in the Bible. If you love that God with all your heart, with all his judgments, the ones that clearly understood and the ones that are hard to understand and all that. It's a good being to love. Now, the reason I say that is this, right? That when you love somebody, and if that person is a mess, that person can take you out. Because whatever you love, you start to pick up their ways. You start picking up their ways, and you start doing like how they do. So the first commandment, to love God with everything you have, emotionally, physically, intellectually. It's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing to love God like that. Because what I know is that whoever you hang around with and talk to too much, you start to pick up their mannerism and their behavior. This is why the Bible says, don't hang around with an angry, an angry man. Because if you hang around with an angry man, Proverbs says, Solomon says, you'll pick up their ways, you'll learn his ways. And you'll end up like him. So, we love God with all our hearts. That constitutes the good life. If you start that way, you're very religious. Oh man, I want to hug you. That's a good way to start life. You see a person who's having a mess in their life? I can tell you they don't love God with all their heart. They're not too serious about religion. Get serious about loving God. I'm going to tell you. You're on the path to a happier life. Because I tell you, many people I've seen in life that they're broken and their life is miserable. It goes back to who they love. Talking to somebody, they said, Oh my, I have so much problems in my life. My life is so, I just feel so depressed. Like, who is your wife? Who you love? Who is your friend? Who you love? Because the more you love, is the more that person affects you. Love God with all your heart. And then verse 30, it said, This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. So notice here, loving thy neighbor, that's relationship. There's many a people right now, I can tell you, that their biggest health problem and their health is that they have nobody in their life that they love. They don't love no one. And because of this, they're missing out on one of the sweetest things that life has to offer. One of the sweetest thing. Number one, loving God. Number two, loving somebody. Loving some people. And the more people you have in your life that you love, 
and they give you back some love. Oh, life is sweet. All right. Because that's the sweetest thing. Right. Always remember this. When it's all said and done, because all these people, they are chasing after K2. I saw somebody post something, I think it was on Facebook, say, go home, the people love you, they're there. Uh, something like leave drugs alone and go home. The people that love you, they you know they're 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 home. They're not on the street. Just think about that idea. Just how a person be loving drugs, loving alcohol, but it's not loving them back. But when you have somebody that loving you, care about you, you always have to bring back to memory. Anytime you know have a good experience with my wife. A good experience with um, a friend, you always bring me back to that. The simple one of the most profound things you learn in a perfect world is that with everything that could make Adam high and happy and satisfied in life, in a garden was there and he still was lonely. We don't know how we, I always wonder how did he demonstrate this to God? Did he just after he finished dressing the garden, he just sat there with his hand, his you know, his elbow on his near his knee and his hand in his face. Ah, <sighs> where where what's what's up? What's going on? <laughs> Something is missing here. So if you have a false idea of what constitutes the good life, and a person is there telling me they're running down drugs and alcohol, and they don't have a good relationship with their wife. And end up trying to invest and put in time to build that communication, build that camaraderie. And I say, well, okay, do you have some friends around? Nothing. Of course, you're gonna go to drugs because you're, you know, in your life is missing all the things that matter. But as I say, when all said and done, there's two relationships. I yet got Adam had a relationship with God. He had a perfect world, and he still was lonely. So this is why relationships work. So human relationships. And I always notice miserable people, they downplay human relationships. And all they want to talk about is the relationship to God. You don't downplay either. Both are important. If you don't have it, you need to start making that investment. You need to start seeking out those relationships because they bless you. And this is why so many people are dr drugged up and stuff like that. Because guess what happened? A lot of them never really did. You know, they were in abusive homes and, you know, all that stuff. And it messed them up. And now they don't know how to form good relationships. And they don't know how to invest. I know people, I've dealt with people personally close, that every relationship they have around them was bad. And I'm going to tell you what is psychosomatic thing about this. I know people that if you're a good person, you try to have a relationship with them, they'll rebuff you. They'll reject you. And they'll find the person that's going to abuse them. There's something in the mind of a sinner that has been abused that they tend to gravitate to abusers. It, it, like they love that type of, um, they call it, mm, my brain here, they call it a relationship where it's like a codependent relationship. I'm a mess, you're a mess, so I go find somebody that's a mess. And I find people that are a mess to mess me up, and then that's the relationship. And they thrive off that. I don't know what it is, but there's something that worth studying. I probably need to go buy a book. So it it is that fascinating thing. So we, we here try to get into relationships that's going to bless us that's why i say you go to god first you love god you love god he ain't gonna mess you up and then you start learning from that relationship to go find people that gonna bless you when we pray to god every day i pray god bless me bless my bless those around me you pray for blessings and then you start to say wait a minute i need to go find people who want to bless me praise the lord <laughs> i wanted to go further but uh, let's see if we can get some more here um Here's a quick example here, Micah 6 verse 8. Micah 6 verse 8. Say, He had showed thee, O man, what is good, and what not the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly before thy God. Again, very important. We have to pray this, and we have to exercise this. Humility, as I said yesterday, is one of the most massive key teachings in the Bible that is never emphasized to the Christian. Rarely do I, you know, I don't ever know, if you come to Jesus at first, people tell you, one of the hugest, biggest, bigly doctrine in the Bible is humility. So, if you don't want to be depressed, you don't want to have to, you want to live a happy life, do justly. When you do the just thing, 
under all circumstances, even to your enemies, God will bless you. When you love mercy, God will bless you. When you're merciful, they always say serial killers are known to like torture animals. They kill cats, kill dogs, kill squirrels. And so they start out that way. And they get mad and crazy and sick and perverted. They have no mercy on the animals. Love mercy. And then simply says, walk humbly before God. You start out your life on that path. You start chasing after that. Like the way a person chases out, chase after marijuana. You know, see a person chasing after marijuana. They have a flag with marijuana on the wall. They wear t-shirts. They tattoo it to themselves. They smoke it. They bathe in it. They use it on their skin. You know, they're just loving marijuana. Love weed. But if you love God like how people love weed, you're on the right path. If you love justice, if you love mercy, if you love humility, you're going off the right path. I guarantee you, a year, 10 years from now, man, you're so blessed. You're going to be a blessing. Not just somebody claim it on you. You're a blessing. Um, and that's what it is. And you live like that, God will bless you. Um, Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, Thou shalt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Every time we make a bad choice and we deviate from the word of God, we bring mess into our lives. It might not be apparent immediately, but as life flows on, sometimes hours, weeks, days, months, years, we realize we should not have deviated. That tells me that in God's way is a part of life. You follow the way of the Lord, God blesses you. God gives you peace. Um, for that thought, I read Philippians 4, verse 5 through 7. Philippians 4, verse 5 through 7. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Notice here, your moderation. Not your lows, not your excesses, but your moderation. If you start off life this way, then what you find is that you take pleasure in things that other people won't take pleasure in. You take pleasure in your consciousness. You take pleasure. And when I say conscious, I mean you're awake, awoke. You're aware of what's going on around you. Not just in your in the generic way, but in a deeper way. You take pleasure in health. You take pleasure in the sweetness of fruits and the nice flavors that God brings through his seasonings. You take pleasure in things that people might not be taking pleasure in. You take pleasure in the happiness of others and so forth and so on. So let your moderation be known to all men, not your drunkenness, not your pride, not your arrogance. Verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't get anxious. But in everything by prayer and supplication, and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You learn self-control. So what do you want in life? Do you want a boat? Do you want an RV? Do you want five homes? Control yourself. Hold back. Let your moderation be made known. Don't lose your self-control. You will sin. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. So no matter what you're going through, you go on the right path. No matter what you've been through and what mess you've experienced in life, you follow Christ's way. And I'm telling you, you don't need the sedation that drunks bring, that alcohol bring. You can be sedated in Jesus Christ. The Spirit will come upon you and will bless you and you'll be a new creature. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, again for your love. Thank you for the promise in your word and for the instructions that we might live and not die. May you bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. God bless you and thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow morning again live where we should do our live talk covering current events. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.